Hello, my friends. You know, we've been talking about excuses for quite a while now. We'll probably be talking about it for a few more months. This excuse this week is no diet works for me. Now, many times an excuse we have for not losing weight will lead us to the correct way to lose weight. This is true of this particular excuse. I've had this excuse and many have voiced it as well. But it's more, it was for me at least, it was more than an excuse. It was the truth. No diet worked for me because I always treated any diet as a short-term fix for what I knew in my heart was a long-term problem that I had. I wanted to think my obsession with overeating certain foods was something that I could overcome with a simple diet plan, a special kind of weight loss pill maybe, or some new prepackaged diet food, something easy, right? I tried everything and nothing worked for me to lose the weight and keep it off. I felt doomed to a life of super morbid obesity, which is where I was. Now, according to the cardiac surgeon, that was going to be a short life if I couldn't figure out how to lose weight and keep it off. But how was I going to do that? Nothing I'd worked, nothing I had tried had worked. And according to everyone I knew, everything I read, everything any doctor had told me, a diet was the only way I could lose weight. I kept knocking on every new diet door that came along. I could lose weight on diets because I had fairly good willpower, but that would only last for say six to nine months. I'd lose a hundred pounds and then I'd celebrate with something decadent, <laughs> you know, kind of food that I'd been avoiding, which would take me right back to eating like I had been before and then gaining more weight than I had just taken off. That's because Diets are designed to help us lose weight. They go on a maintenance program, which allows us to eat more food. Now for a food addict, sugar addict like me, this never helped me change my habits and adopt a forever lifestyle plan. I couldn't, I couldn't change anything if I was just continuing to eat after I lost the weight. Diet programs really don't work to keep the weight off, but they are still very popular because everyone pushes them. This is really disconcerting to me now that I know that habit change is really the only way to lose weight and keep it off. Diet programs make their money from return customers. And I'm raising my hand here because I returned to diet, to the diet program that I was most successful on many times, at least four, maybe more. Each time I spent thousands of dollars, mainly on credit cards, which is why I got into debt. <laughs> That's another obsession that we easily fall into. I spent thousands of dollars taking weight off only to put it back on again and add more to it. See, the reason I couldn't stay with it was because it greatly limited my food choices and kept me under a thousand calories a day. Now, I don't, I don't think that's good for anyone. Um, they say women especially should eat, eat at least 1200 calories a day just to keep up your health. It did help me lose weight for this time that I was on it. But I felt starved the whole time and couldn't wait to reach my goal so that I could go off the diet again, celebrate by eating my favorite dessert. And I thought I deserved that after what I had just gone through starving myself. Now, this was before I understood that sugar is very addictive to me. One taste and I want more. I had not given it up for good. I would just set it aside for the time that I was on the diet and knowing 
that I would eventually go back to eating it. I thought sugar helped me manage my emotions, but friends, it didn't, didn't at all. It only masked, masked my emotions. And then I would need more to help me pretend that those feelings weren't there. It was an endless cycle. It was all because I was afraid to be, feel, to be human and to feel any emotion that might make me referring angry or crying buckets of tears and despondency. I'd grown up trying to mask those emotions because I saw others who allowed their emotions to rule their lives and actually ruin their lives. And I felt that made them not good for anything. So I didn't want to feel my emotions. I knew my soul was comprised of my mind, will, and emotions. That's the essence of me. And I wanted my mind to lead me. Now, that seemed like a rational thing for me to do, right? God gave me a mind, let it lead me. But I didn't realize that my mind was clouded by and ruled by my emotions. And even though it felt like I was making good decisions, which is that willpower aspect of my soul, my emotions were really overriding both my thoughts and my decisions. And why? Because I I was trying to push them down and they were trying to rise up. And they were really ruling everything about me. So finally, I just got up, resigned myself, gave it all up, you know. I, I don't have to diet anymore. I'm not going to do it. And I resigned myself to just be fat and happy. Now, at 430 pounds, friends, I was not happy, not in the least. I had multiple diseases, congestive heart failure, high blood pressure, diabetes. I could hardly walk. I, when I went on vacation with my family, I took multiple books so I could sit in the car and read while they explored the beauty of these new vistas that we were seeing. I saw myself not as happy, but as a big fat blob. And I regularly told myself that's what I was. And that only made me feel worse. And if you're calling yourself that, it's going to make you feel worse. And that triggered my emotions to tell my mind and my will that I needed something sweet to eat. I carried my own stash with me everywhere I went, so I'd be sure to have it. I never wanted to be without my drug of choice. And then, as you probably know, if you've been listening to my podcast, a rude cardiac surgeon changed my life by telling me I had five years to live if I didn't lose at least 100 pounds and keep it off, which was the kicker, keeping it off. He was the first person to tell me that my future was really in my hands. It was in the choices I was making. It was in what I ate and what I didn't eat. It was, I was really treating the foods I loved like a lifeline, but they were really a tool that the enemy was using to destroy me. For the first time, very first time in my life, I asked myself, do I really want to live or am I okay with dying this slow, painful, but early death and still eating all of the sugar that I wanted? Is that what I wanted my children to remember about me? Did I want to leave a legacy that said she ate what she wanted and it took her life? No diet work for me was an excuse I used, but friends, it was also a real truth. And so I asked myself again, is there a different way to lose weight? And if so, what is it? All I ever knew was if I needed to lose weight, I had to go on a diet. And even knowing that I could never lose weight and keep it off on diets, when that cardiac surgeon gave me the death sentence, I did the only thing I knew to do. and go. I went back on another diet. And the same thing happened again. 
However, then I started getting really worried because I was fast approaching that five-year deadline given me for my life to end. Now, I'm so glad that God had other plans. His plans were not the plans of the surgeon. He placed me in a meeting where, where a mentor of mine made this offhanded statement in the middle of the talk he was making. And he said, alcohol is one molecule away from sugar. Alcohol is liquid sugar. That's all it took. It was like I saw all the pieces of my life come together like a magnetic puzzle. The heavens seemed to open. And I realized that my it, what my issue was, I was like an alcoholic only with sugar. To get free of the weight I was carrying, I was going to have to figure out how to stop eating sugar. Not an easy task for a sugar addict. But as, as you might remember, back in 1977, God had told me to stop eating sugar and flour, but I had ignored him because I felt I couldn't stop eating those things altogether. Everything I ate seemed to have those as some part of the ingredients. And I loved to bake because that was something Grandma and I did together. Now, how could I stop eating all the great foods I grew up with? And how could I stop baking those things? Because every time I did, I remembered her. Still in the moment when I heard the connection between sugar and alcohol, I knew I was a sugar addict, even though I had never heard of the term sugar addiction. I hadn't heard the term used at all. But I knew I was a sugar addict if, even if I was the only person on the planet who was one. I also knew that I needed to get sugar out of my life for good. Now, it seemed like a really impossible task because I had stopped eating sugar for nine months or so on all these various diets that I had been on, only for me to go right back to it. I was drawn to it like a moth is drawn to a flame. It was clearly killing me, but how could I ever stop it altogether? It seemed like it was just as much a part of me as brown eyes and freckles. Couldn't get rid of it. But I needed help, so I joined a group that my mentor started. It wasn't just for people like me who had eating issues. It was for those who had any kind of of problems with addictive behaviors. And I was surprised to learn that addiction of any kind can be overcome in two fairly distinct steps. First, know exactly why you want to overcome it. Not because someone told you, but your why. And second, learn how to change your habits. Both of these were real keys for me. First, I had to realize that I had to want to change and I had to see sugar for the harm it was doing to my body. It had started out as something to help me anesthetize my pain and deal with my emotions. However, it had become a stronghold in my life. And the only way to break that stronghold was to surrender sugar to God. It's a really difficult process for sure, but when God convicted me of the fact that sugar had become like a God to me, I was finally willing to let him show me how to let it go. I discovered the big issue wasn't so much surrendering sugar to God, it was learning how to get rid of it for the rest of my life. I had never been able to do this before. And that's because I'm kind of like an all or nothing person. I wanted to get rid of it all at once, but that never worked for me. I wanted transformation. I desired transformation, but I wanted it to be quick and easy because that's how I wanted everything. That's what all the diets promise, right? That's kind of why I went back to diets. They'd say, you know, just eat like this, you'll lose all the weight you want to lose. 
Well, that is true. They don't promise me that I can keep the weight off. I wasn't transforming if I was just standing the weight back. I was going backwards by gaining more weight by going on a diet and then going off again. Transformation, though, is not possible without your mind being renewed. Now, we've all programmed our minds a certain way for way too many years, and my habits were firmly ingrained. To change them seemed impossible. Romans 12.2 in the NIV, NIV tells us that in order to transform, we have to allow God to renew our minds. And the message version of this scripture really helped me understand in a practical sense what I needed to do. Fix your attention on God and you'll be changed from the inside out. Something clicked when I read that and I finally saw that only if God was my focus could I be changed, transformed, and renewed, remade from the inside out. I had always focused on the outside of me since that's what seemed to be the biggest problem area, right? How do I fix my weight? How do I change this huge body into something more normal? But God was showing me from his word that the only way it was going to happen was to fix my attention on him. I had never really asked God to help me lose weight. I only asked him to bless any diet I ran across. And I realized he couldn't bless those diets because back in 1977, he had already told me what I needed to do, which was stop eating sugar. I just couldn't figure out how to do that when no diet seemed to work for me. The truth I finally accepted was that I can't have any type of change in my physical appearance until I have an entire spiritual transformation. I never thought I needed that. I thought God and I were like best buds, you know? I think he was that to me, but I was not living up to my part. One of the first steps was to admit what I had done to God. I had amassed all of this weight on my body. I had desecrated the place he considered his temple. I cried, I mourned, I wept, and I surrendered my life and my addictions to him. I had rebelled against him and sinned because I had not done what he clearly told me to do. And he didn't even tell me just once. He told me many times through the years. What David said in Psalms 51, 1 through 2, this is in the Passion Translation, became my heart cry. God, give me mercy from your fountain of forgiveness. I know your abundant love is enough to wash away my guilt because your compassion is so great. Take away this shameful guilt of sin. Forgive the full extent of my rebellious ways and erase this deep stain on my conscience. What I really wanted was a changed heart that longed only to do what God wanted me to do. I wanted forgiveness for what I had done and for him to take me back into his good graces. Psalms 51.12, and this is in the Passion Translation, expresses my true desires. Let my passion for life be restored, tasting joy in every breakthrough you bring to me. Hold me close to you with a willing spirit that obeys whatever you say. Now, breaking the stronghold I had allowed sugar to have over my life was what I needed, but it didn't happen all at once. I knew that I didn't gain the weight in a few months and I wasn't going to lose it in that time frame either. But I was committed to him for the long term haul for however long it took and actually for the rest of my life. 
And the next step was to surrender to God. And I, I thought I had done that years ago, but I realized there was one big issue I'd been holding back just for me. Romans 12, 1. And I he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of, mercy, of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I had to give myself to him. What God was saying to me was I had to surrender everything about my fleshly desires to him. And those were easy to identify. They were anything made with sugar and flour. The message version says it this way. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Now this version, it, I emphasized it because it throws food into the mix. Now I was okay with all the rest of the things, but I knew I had not given the foods I loved to God as an offering. So I just asked God, what does it look like for me to surrender sugar to you? Can I even do that? Because no diet ever told me I had to stop eating sugar for the rest of my life. It feels truly impossible, even improbable to me. But as I said that to him, he showed me, again, my life. <laughs> and as I looked back over it, the more I knew this was what I had to do. And he reminded me of the story of the rich young ruler in the Bible. Doesn't really have anything to do with food, but it has to do with surrender. He wanted to, he wanted, God wanted uh, or the rich young ruler wanted to know how to have eternal life. He said he followed all of the rules. And Jesus told him, if you remember, to sell everything, and give the money to the poor. Then in Luke 18, 23, it tells us the man went away sad because he was very rich. Then the disciples asked, asked Jesus, then who in the world can be saved? And Jesus said, what is impossible for people is possible with God, Luke 18, 27. You see, if the rich young ruler had trusted in the main thing he loved, if he had trusted that to God, which was his wealth, then he would be saved. This was impossible for him to do because he was counting on his money to save him, to get him through this life. And I realized it was, it was a, well, his wealth was like a mini God to him. And I realized that I was doing the same thing with the foods I loved. I was counting on them to get me through life instead of God. They were like, Sugar was like my my God, and I had to surrender it, and I had to change my habits. So finally, I was ready to do that, and thankfully, my mentor was a tremendous help with that process, and I learned that I couldn't sustain a diet on my own, but I could change my habits one at a time and step into a freedom that I never knew existed. So I'd surrendered sugar to God, but I knew I couldn't stop eating it all at once because I would just start eating it again like I'd done before. It had to be a slow, gradual, but all-encompassing change for me. Fitness instructor Jillian Michaels says it this way, transformation is not five minutes from now. It is a present activity. In this moment, you can make a different choice. And it's these small choices and small successes that build up over time to help cultivate a healthy self-image and self-esteem. What I learned on my habit change journey is stop, a stop without a start is just a diet. We will go back to the way we've always eaten if we don't start a new healthful habit in the place of the habit we've stopped. 
This is why diets never work, but why, why lifestyle change does work. It brings new habits into our life, which if we continue to do them regularly, will overwrite the old habits that we have formed for years of doing it that way. Now, a habit is just a shortcut that we have programmed into our brains by doing it over and over to get a specific reward or feeling. So whenever we want that reward or feeling, we will think that our brain will automatically take us to that habit. And we that's why we feel like we're doing it on autopilot because we don't have to think about it. To change a bad habit, we have to put a new better habit in its place that will give us that same kind of reward. Now, it takes maybe two to three weeks of intentionally stopping the bad habit and putting a good habit in its place to overwrite that bad habit and make it stick. So I started with my trigger food, which I knew was candy. I decided to stop eating candy, start exercising three times a week for 30 minutes. It was amazing how it worked. Exercise made me feel so much better than eating candy did. So much so that I look forward to exercise. I like to exercise in the pool and I just threw the candy away. It was kind of childish anyway, so I didn't need it. After making exercise my new habit, I began stopping other bad habits and starting good ones in their place. One stop start at a time. It takes time to do this, but it was highly successful for me. You know, for 30 years, I had been trying to diet and lose weight. And all that happened was I gained weight instead of losing it. In light of that, habit change looks like a little blip on the timeline of my life. It's the key that helped me lose 250 pounds and keep it off. So God showed me Galatians 6, 9 in a kind of a different light. This is the verse that says, let us know, let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Now, I never thought of this verse in regard to taking care of myself, but it really fits in that context because we give up on ourselves way too soon. You know, I admire those in my Overcomers Academy coaching group who stay with the process and don't give up, even though they have setbacks. The great thing about a coaching group is that there are others on the journey with you who have the same issues and are encouraging you to keep going. You know, God is on our sides with this process. He wants us to succeed. succeed. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 in the Passion Translation says, He has taught you to let go of the lifestyle of the ancient man, the old self-life, which was corrupted by sinful and deceitful desires that spring from, from delusions. Now it's time to be made new by every revelation that's been given to you and to be transformed as you embrace the glorious Christ within you as your new life and live in union with him. For God has recreated you all over again in his perfect righteousness and you now belong to him in the realm of true holiness. The goal here is to get so close to Jesus that you can hardly stand it. He wants to help us, but he can't help us if we are fighting against what he wants for us. Second Corinthians 3, 16 through 17 says, Whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And then verse 18 describes exactly what God wants to do in our lives. All of us who have had that veil or that mask removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Other versions use the word 
transfigured or transformed here instead of change. So transformation or change is really what God desires for us. This is why a simple man-made plan is not going to work for us. We desperately need God's leadership for every step of our transformation journey. Our goal should not be just to lose weight. Our goal should be to transform into the person God desires us to be. And that means we must follow God. We have to listen to him. This is more difficult than just following a diet plan. It encompasses every part of us, body, soul, and spirit. You know, I used to think that the only part of me that was out of kilter was my body. And now I know that's just not true. We are triune beings. If one part of us seems greatly out of sync, then every part of us is out of sync. The most important part of us is our spirit, though. And if our spirit is in line with God's spirit, if we are listening to him, following his voice, and doing what he tells us to do, the rest of us will begin to fall in line as well. So let me pray for you. Father God, more than anything else, we desire transformation. We want to lose weight, but more than that, we want to follow you. We want to listen to you and do what you tell us to do. Please make it clear and plain to us what that is. Help us renew our minds. Help us focus our spirits on following your Holy Spirit. Help us to desire transformation over anything else. Help us to want to surrender the foods we love that are dragging us down to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, don't forget that Doors to Overcomers Academy are open now, and you get a free copy of Sweet Surrender when you join. That's at TracyShieldsParker.com backslash overcomers. If you want one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, you can find that there on my website as well, and the links will be down in the show notes. So until next week, sweet grace for your journey.